As a gamer, I have always been a fan of Sega, the Mega Drive being the first console I bought when I was 11 years old, later followed by a Saturn and a Dreamcast. What I regret the most is that during the years I sold all of them except the Dreamcast. I'll try to learn from my mistakes. I won't sell my Dreamcast. Ever. So, I bought it somewhere around 2001. Yes, it's the Euro version, but I had to get a mod chip installed, as it was the only way to play the US version of Soul Calibur that my friend had. Damn how awesome game it is even today's standards! Not all games of Dreamcast are so serious or necessarily stylish, but they're still very good and fun to play. Capcom is famous for many fighting games as well as games with wacky cartoony characters. On this episode I'll review two campy Capcom games that I consider as good examples of games that are indeed cheesy, but also fun to play. Ah, Japanese, they really master how to make absolutely fabulous title screenshots. Tekromancer is a fighting game with anime style mechas, having at least one pilot, some of them being piloted by several characters. All the characters have pretty extensive storylines that are revealed when you play story mode. There's even dialogue scenes between battles, which makes the game seem like an anime series. Unlike most mecha games I've played, Tecromancer has a very tongue-in-cheek attitude that can easily be seen from its visual style. I don't think it's a coincidence that this Paulson fellow looks like an Ultraman, one of the campiest action heroes of Japan. How about Bolon and Polin, this clown-like robot piloted by a young girl? This definitely isn't the first thing that comes to my mind when thinking about a huge mecha walking over a city. The game mechanics are a bit different than on the most fighting games. Instead of rounds, there are two life meters and an armor gauge. When the second life meter runs out, the fight is over. Strong attacks can destroy armor completely, which makes mecha more vulnerable to attacks. There's a final attack for characters to pull off when enemy has 50% or less left on their second life meter. When achieved successfully, it destroys the opponent immediately. Differences between mechas are pretty enormous. For instance, if you choose this bulky tank-like mecha, your mobility is pretty much zero and you can jump at all. That's supposed to balance the fact that it's armed to the teeth and can basically nuke enemies down with weapons of mass destruction. Tech Romancer is a good example of the Japanese skill of adding very cheesy ingredients to a soup and still keeping it delicious. All this gain is work somehow, and especially if you like anime of any kind, this may entertain you very well. Even though I am not a very big fan of anime myself, I found the story in story mode fun to follow. The biggest problem that I can come up with is that the gameplay is a bit bulky. The controls aren't the best and many robots are clumsy to control over a relatively flat terrain. Speaking of which, the terrain of the game could have been more interactive, the surroundings weren't used very well. Destroying buildings and other similar objects could have much more potential to improve gameplay. This is a good bridge of asses to play the next game that succeeds better on this field. It's also more fun to play with your friends, so let's proceed. Power Stone 2 is the sequel to the first Power Stone game, which is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game from isometric perspective. Both games are centered around Power Stones, a kind of diamonds that appear on every level. 
When a character manages to collect them all, he or she changes for a moment into a super-powered version with a completely different appearance. During this relatively short period of time, normal attacks may launch heat-seeking missiles, razor-sharp shurikens, or electric shock waves, depending on each character. You can also perform super attacks by pressing shoulder buttons of a controller. Super attacks eat most of your power, depending how much you have left, so you may only be able to do them once or twice. Then the character returns to normal and the stones are scattered all over the level. Crates and other similar containers may have the power stones, but also different kind of weapons. These weapons may come in handy, as they help you to hit your enemies badly enough to make them lose the stones they possess. You can also use turrets, catapults, etc. of the environment for your benefit. When I played Power Stone for the first time, it was quite difficult to get a picture of what's going on. The characters are quite small from the bird's eye view perspective, and there's a lot of action going on most of the time. Especially if you watch someone else playing, it looks very chaotic. Many of my friends didn't want to try it, as it looked difficult to play. However, when you grab a controller yourself, you'll find that it's not so bad after all. Capcom have managed to make the controls very good. Different characters also feel different. Big ones are slow, but they can take a lot of damage. Even though the first Power Stone seemed very chaotic to me, the sequel is even worse, or better, depending on your point of view. It's quite obvious as we get four players instead of two, but there's more. All stages have several levels and when it's time to move, there's usually a cool transition to it. For example, one level begins from an airship flying in the air, soon to be destroyed and all players fall for a while during which you can fight for a limited amount of umbrellas to save your ass. When the next level comes, you lose health unless you have an umbrella, and then fight continues in this new environment. On the sea level you fight over two submarines that go underwater time to time, with the fight later ending on an iceberg. One level contains a reference to the Raiders of the Lost Ark, as players have to escape through a corridor chased by a huge boulder. Of course this game was mostly meant to be played with your friends. It's a very good party game if you are able to persuade your friends to give it a try. When they try, just let them get all the stones for a moment and they will get hooked as their character changes to an over-the-top campy monster of some sort to kick everyone's ass. Another great thing is the pretty neat co-op mode, especially beating new kinds of bosses the only problem is that there are too few of them, with only the Sphinx and the final boss at the end. This leads to another downside. For co-op the game is way too short. The last stage is indeed pretty hard, but it feels like it was prolonged on purpose because they didn't have much of anything else. A minor downside of the sequel is also the fact that adding players makes super characters seem a little dull compared with the first Power Stone game. In the first one, the levels were much smaller with just two players, allowing exaggerated superpowers to get all the attention they deserved. Now the camera is floating much higher as it has to show more players. In that context, wacky super duper XL arts thingama bombs have no such a jaw dropping effect. Well, then my final verdict. Both. Necromancer and Power Stone 2 are great examples of how the Japanese can put huge amounts of cheesy stuff into a game and still keep it very playable and entertaining. Wacky ideas show up in all aspects, script, graphics, sound and game design. Too many game developers choose the easy way, going with the concepts we have seen thousands of times before. Being weird doesn't make any game good, but it definitely helps to keep things fresh and original. That's why I recommend these two games to anyone who owns a Dreamcast, or is considering buying one. With an open mind and the rainbow side of the force, you can't go wrong with these.